free. We all eat, breathe, and believe in our power and vitality. Free. We eat food for thought, soup for the soul, candied yams of truth, and black-eyed peas for change we grow. Free. Free as in powerful, as in resilient, towering over challenges that plague us, giants feeding giants. But even giants trip over obstacles. Story tonight, a closed sign brings an error, the end to an error. For many low-income minority neighborhoods, the unthinkable has happened. Double Eight Foods went out of business today, closing its remaining four stores. And it happened without notice to its customers and employees alike. RTV6's Jack Reinhardt has reaction. A shock and a punch in the gut to the neighborhood. The Double Eight not only put food on the table, but it provided jobs for people here in the neighborhood. No one saw it coming. The neighborhood grocery, the mom and pop store, now closed. After 58 years, turning the lights off, thank you. That's going to be a bummer for the people around here, as far as the grocery store. Ain't no stores open. So you got to go to the big store. March, Kroger. Farther you away. Have no choice. And for many in the neighborhood, Double Eight was the only choice. A walkable destination for fresh meat and produce and staples like bread, butter, and milk. The store's closing is a setback for a neighborhood struggling to reinvigorate itself. And now that not being available is devastating for many of the low to moderate income residents and other residents also. The closing of the Double Eight leaves the neighborhood without a grocery for miles around. The only options, a smattering of food marts stocked with fried foods and cola, and the shuttered doors leave more than just another empty building in Mapleton Fall Creek. Where are they going to go now? This was already a food desert, and now it's, <laughs> I don't know what the definition is going to be now. We have to understand that you are what you eat. Food, what you eat, and what you don't eat is directly tied to how you think, how well you think, how quickly you process information, how thoroughly you process information, how well you're able to even receive information in the first place. If you want to keep a whole people in an oppressed position to where they cannot rise to self-dependent independence and be in a do-for-self mentality and be successful at doing for self, then you start with their food. My name is Lakaya Muhammad, and I am originally from St. Louis, Missouri, but I've been in Indianapolis for almost 19 years. My food journey began, um, I heard a message by Minister Farrakhan, and he talked about even if we ate the right foods, that we would still die because the merchants of death are in control of our food. So he talked about all of the chemicals that are put in our food to kill us. And I had just had my first son, so that really resonated with me. So that is where my interest in food started. Uh, fast forward to after I had my third son, uh, one of my good friends sent me an application for Growing Good in the Hood, and that is really where my food journey began. Growing Good in the Hood is a program for the community and people who have little to no resources, but basically it's a program to teach them how to grow food for free um, from seed to harvest and just literally infusing the community with the importance of growing our own food. This community has little to no access to fresh foods and fresh produce that give life. There's a lot of store closings like Walmart and the Double Eights and Kroger's in the black community. If you look around, um, one of the biggest issues is trash. And you don't see banana peels and orange peels. You see pop and alcohol and all of the things that plague our community. 
So one of the biggest challenges would be the access to the fresh food that will actually be life-giving and help heal the ailments that we have as a community, mentally, physically, and spiritually. A community is just as important as the actual process of growing food. Without the community, you really don't have the desire to grow food. Um, and one of the low impacts is connecting our community with the best part of the tribulations that we've been through. I think a lot of us want to discard the farming aspect because it's so painful from generational curses from slavery. However, the lawyer, the doctor, the nurse, everybody needs to eat. So one of the low impact is getting the community to see the importance of having our own, being self-reliant, self-sustaining. We have a problem, we are the solution. My favorite story would have to be Makayla. At the time, she was a two-year-old grower. She lost her mother suddenly, um, and Makayla really struggled with behavioral issues. And so she came out here and she would work in the garden. She was very, very alert. She was very aware, very focused. And so she helped to manage some of the plots back here, but it also put a smile on her face and it also calmed her behavioral issues. So that was, I guess, the biggest win for me with infusing community into growing good in the hood. You know, Indianapolis is a microcosm of a macrocosm. Every city in America is actually struggling with this right now. Um, I would say Indianapolis needs to mobilize more community growers, show the community and people who live in the community how to grow food in their backyards, grow food in buckets on their patio. It literally needs to be a revolution of growing food. I would say that's, that's the solution. My name is Taisha Ahmed, and I am a farmer. I am an artist. I am a jewelry designer. It's a lot. But basically, my love right now is farming and being able to grow food for my community. I've negotiated entry claims for about 10 years. I left that uh, in order to be able to spend more time with my son because I felt that's what I was needed to do. Let me do something else. Let me try to see what's going on in my community and how I can help since I have this free time and my spirit is telling me this is what I need to do. When the double A closed in 2015, um, I was working with the Northwest Quality of Life Plan and uh, Kepper Institute had an event here. Um, I believe it was uh, a symposium where they had uh, different organizations, like it might have been someone who had their own community grocery store, uh, a food co-op, a food hub. Um, and basically they were telling everybody like their journey, how they started. Kepper Institute uh, had talked about a uh, food co-op. We looked at different models, uh, talked to different people, and basically, CCFI, the Community Controlled Initiative, is what came out of that situation. Um, going through that process of getting that up and going, uh, one of the issues was trying to find farmers, trying to find farmers that are local. Because um, we would have to go about two hours or so to be able to find a farmer to buy produce from. Um, I even made phone calls to some of our local farmers here and we weren't asking them to donate the food. You're a farmer, you grow food. We would like to buy food from you wholesale. You know, is that possible? So out of that is how I started actually growing. Because my thing is, well, if the need is we need people to grow the food, well, I'll try to be one of those people who grows the food. The biggest challenge I'm seeing right now is affordability. Access is also an issue too. Um, the neighborhood in which I live, I live in the Northwest area. I live on 31st and Clifton. We're trying to grow organically. Uh, we're trying to make sure that our community can have healthy food. But in order to do that, you gotta have, you know, you gotta have the nutrients, you gotta have what the soil needs. You have to find different ways in order to keep the soil healthy because that's where we're getting our nutrients from but people have to be able to afford it. I can't necessarily afford organic. So that's why growing it myself, I can eat what I grow. And what I would like to be able to do is to provide it at a cost that my community can afford. We have a lot of stuff that's not being used. We have a lot of stuff that is discarded. So let's clean that up. Let's do something with it. Okay, for my little farm, I have eight lots over in my neighborhood. Right now we're only working one. 
I have five kids that are working on my lot. We have squash in the ground, we have collards, we have tomatoes in the ground, we have mustard in the ground. And the process will be basically the kids are growing the produce. Once it's time to harvest, they'll be harvesting the produce. And what I would like to see happen is for there to be a market in my neighborhood. Do I see any improvement? Do I see things getting better from where I stand? I do, but I'm just one person with one little lot and five kids. But I see the change in these kids since they have started. You know, they know about the foods, they know where it comes from, they're excited. They work from seven in the morning to 12. And they're happy to come every day. To me, to me that's progress because we're able to grow these kids. I don't think things happen by happen chance. You know, I think your life is ordered in a path where certain things are meant to happen. And I think all these things transpire to have me doing what I'm doing now. If you can grow your own food, you should never be hungry. We control our destinies, building and creating the new planting the seeds for the future's bright bloom. We stay free, free as in sweat equity, as in connectivity, as in reaching heights upon heights still firmly rooted with limbs stretched to the horizons. Um, in my experience going to the pantry with my brother who is disabled, um, they would never have things that were good for his diet. All the food is processed, canned, expired, and then what fresh produce that they had was less desirable. Um, it was low quality and it was expiring, if not already expired. <laughs> Lawrence Community Garden is a not-for-profit farm. We focus on education, we teach farming skills, and uh, homesteading skills, how to raise chickens and bees, and how to care for produce using organic methods, um, irrigation and season extension techniques, because we want people to be able to eat all year. So those are the things that Lawrence Community Garden, that's what Lawrence Community Garden is, it's a teaching garden. Good morning. All right. So our garden is a community garden where the community as a whole at large comes in and helps us to grow the food and then 50% of what we grow goes back out into the community in the form of donations. The other 50% goes out into the community in the affordable access. I believe that food access, the insecurity issues are caused by systemic issues. The government, legislators, politicians have allowed companies to come in and come into our neighborhoods that really take advantage of our people. They don't have our people's best interests in mind. Um, they're very specific about the items that they put into grocery stores that we are allowed to purchase. So we think that we have freedom by even going to the grocery store and we have a car, but the grocery store is still uh, not a free place. Lawrence Community Garden was a project for me when it started. Along the way, I had a heart attack. And so Lawrence Community Garden became more than just a project, it became a passion. Um, I'm growing my medicine. Right in between here. If you get off course, step back and look. Oh, yeah, I'm still straight. We gonna plant right here. Now, if we get them all planted, guess what we gonna do? We're gonna pick up our two steaks and we're gonna go over there. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By far, as well, the biggest reward is the blessing of feeding people. Our interface with the community, seniors and youth, and how we bring that all together. Because one thing for sure is that all people eat. Our agency is freedom incarnate, indescribable, the beauty of gems that emerge from pressure. It's all here, and we have what we need. Elephants are fiercely, and I do mean fiercely, loyal to their youth. Elephants are fiercely protective and loyal to their youth. They're fiercely protective and loyal to their community. And they're herbivores. Um, so they are a very big mammal that has a very large footprint, but a very large green footprint. Mm -hmm. And so... 
we thought that would be a nice um, symbol for what we hope to represent. The Elephant Gardens consist of two locations, 3348 Sherman and 3263 Denny. Uh, each are a quarter acre location. In addition, we have about eight rows at our home in the backyard, and we also have an herb garden in our front yard. The Elephant Garden started out just being a family garden in the backyard just to grow some of our own veggies so we wouldn't have to run to the grocery store every time we needed green peppers or tomatoes. We'd just go out the backyard and get them. But with the closing of the double A, uh, it kind of pushed us to another level of, okay, we're here in our neighborhood. We need to do something to try to bring fresh, organic produce to our neighbors. And that's basically where our initiative has taken us and where we keep trying to stay in the area and take care of our neighbors. We don't pretend to be the panacea, but we do believe that agriculture can be a panacea for many of the, the issues that plague our communities, whether it be youth unemployment or underemployment of adults, neighborhood blight, health issues. All of these things plague our neighborhood, but agriculture, in one way or another, if applied appropriately, can be a solution for all of those problems. You can turn blight into beautification. You can turn an unhealthy population into a healthy population by teaching them how to transform their diet from junk food to a more produce-based diet. The benefit is the neighborhood and their response um, to us and to um, what we're doing. Oftentimes we'll be in 90 degree weather going, what in the world got into us? Why? Why? <laughs> and it just takes one person coming down the street and saying, I love your garden. Thank you for what you're doing. Um, or one of the children that we're training to, um, you know, say, I didn't like eating this particular vegetable, but now, you know, it's okay. Um, or, or just seeing that light bulb go off in um, someone's head, adult or child, when they go, oh, that's how that grows. Sometimes we don't know the impact until we run across somebody and go, oh, you're the, you're the people, that garden right there on 33rd, I pass it all the time, oh my God, thank you. you know. So I think the impact of the visual and, and the fact that there's something in the neighborhood where someone took it and instead of putting some crap there, <laughs> they decided to take something and, and build it up to something um, worth, worth looking at. You know, if you can just show one person or just have an impact on that one person, that's the one we can see, but there are so many that we don't even know and may never know that have been impacted by what we're doing. I think it takes all of us. It's, it's, it, it's going to take each and every one of us in what we are doing. This is a multifaceted problem, and so it's going to take multifaceted solutions. Free as community can create itself to be, with imagination as limitless as energy and ecosystems above, below, within, and throughout the grid that grows and cradles life. We are inseparable from the soil in which we are planted, rooted in our collective solutions. And joined with unity, we grow, we learn, and we bear such beautiful fruit.